is this really the best tool we could come up with to add resistance to human movement? We've got to be asking ourselves, how far is this bar going to take us? How far is exercises based on ground-based movements going to take us? We've learned a lot in strength and conditioning in the last 30, 40, 50, 100 years. In the future, they're going to be looking at us and thinking, wow, was that behind? So what's going to move us forward? I have another question for you. What is going to get us to an 8.900 meter dash? I have 100% confidence that's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen because of a bigger squat. Today, we're going to be talking about wearable resistance. Now, there's a lot of people not just taking a look at wearable resistance, but using it now to change the conversation, the game, and performance at the highest levels. Today, we're going to be walking through what we call the five W's, who, what, when, where, why on it, and also the how, because we get asked a lot, where do I get started? Where does it fit in? And it's really important to understand that amongst the tools that we have versus the tools that we're starting to develop for something new. The what? Go back to that bar. There are two different types of resistance and, and I'm giving you these categories for a reason as you'll see. One, we have traditional resistance training, TRT. And two, we have wearable resistance training. So what is traditional versus wearable resistance and why delineate them? Isn't it all just weight? No. Traditional resistance training is kind of what you see on the board here. It's all the stuff we kind of know, bars, cables, battles, dumbbells, straps, uh, cables, whatever it might be. And they share some benefits and they share some limitations that we need to understand. They train moderate to maximal levels of strength, power, or body mass. You know, that's really their big 80%. That's their forte. Uh, they can stimulate high levels of testosterone, which is really important for athletes in certain sports and people at certain ages. Um, it can contribute to speed, agility, change of direction, endurance, but it does invariably, it disrupts technique and movement, all of it. It does limit transference, uh, oftentimes to real sport or competitive environment. And most important, the equipment defines the movement, not the person. That's what makes traditional resistance different you're tethered. With wearable resistance, uh, first thing to note is it doesn't replace those maximal benefits that we get from traditional resistance training. You know, if you're a football lineman trying to put on weight preseason, yeah, you're going to need a little more than a few kilos at high speed moving to sort of stimulus that kind of growth or that focus. But what wearable does is it trains optimal skill, speed, power, endurance. And by optimal, optimizes a competitive environment. There's no disruption to specific skill and technique, and this is critical, and our research is back this. Speed and range of motion for a movement remain at or near competition speeds, and that's critical if you're training speed. Um, it's used in your actual sports setting. Traditional resistance is generally used in a gym setting or a non-competitive sports setting. You can't squat down a football pitch with a soccer ball, but you can run with wearable resistance. Transference to competitive performance is direct because you're using wearable resistance in your sport, not as a supplement to it. With wearable resistance, the user is in control. The user defines the movement pattern. But you have to understand, we have different tools in our toolbox. And if that doesn't evolve, we're not moving the field forward. The who, who can use wearable resistance? That's really simple, anybody. It's got no issues as far as gender goes. There's nothing that uh, uh, limits anybody in those categories for use of exogen or wearable resistance. There's a lot of specific loading we can do around hip issues, knee issues, ankle issues, and landing mechanics, Q angle biomechanics. That really gets exciting. Uh, second one is age. When would you start with wearable resistance? Little kids and young kids and youth really don't need to be loaded. They're learning a lot about their bodies. Unless you're in a high demand youth sport like gymnastics, there might be some need for micro loading at that phase, but we generally suggest start from puberty aboard. In terms of sport or activity, man, you can use Exogen now everywhere. We've got people use it on the ski hills. We've got moguls, we've got trapeze artists. Uh, we haven't tested on the moon yet, but I think the space shuttle might happen. What level of athlete? A lot of people look at our, our content online and say, wow, you work with really high level athletes. But I'd say 30, 50% of our clientele right now is what we call weekend warriors, competitive recreational, um, you know, age groupers, just the people like you and me that are actively engaged in their sport, uh, love it, spend time with it, and want to improve. And last thing is injury status. Um, Exogen is one of the best tools I think we found really for what's called the return to play stage. It really works in later stage rehab and we'll talk more about that in a separate video. All right, well, let's talk about the sporting session, not the gym session. Every sporting session is a warm up, 
It's got some sort of technical, tactical training. And at the end, you've got some level of gameplay or endurance. A warm-up protocol is a great place to start putting a bit of exogen on during your warm-up, 20, 30 minutes prior to every training session, takes your entire, what's called baseline to a higher level. We've seen people win, set world records, PBs, just by incorporating it in their warm-up. And the Argentina study that you can click in the link is one of the best examples we've done that's driven by us with the under 17, 19 uh, national champions of Argentina in football, which basically means some of the best guys in the world. Our eight week study there was pretty phenomenal, the result. The next place you'd look at is technical skill. Uh, this is putting exogen in, in an area that I call technical conditioning, and we'll have a separate session on this. But it really looks at using exogen as a coaching tool to tweak movement. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then the last thing is gameplay protocol, putting weight on the body while you're playing your sport. So just think of a basketball player trying to get stronger in their arms, loaded up on the arms for 20 minutes of A versus B, offense versus defense. Imagine how your arms feel in every movement. Do that for six weeks. Take that load off, go into a game, and imagine what your opponent feels in your arm strength. And of course, the last area is return to play, but I'm going to leave injury out of this for the moment. When in my season? When in the season? When and during the year can I use Exogen? We just worked through a bunch of the World Championship people at uh, Eugene. Some of them started with us four to six weeks prior to the race on specific technical issues with high level athletes that we were able to make massive change, drop PBs and put people in finals or medal contention in a very short period. Preseason, off season is a great time. Throw it in, put it in your warm ups, get acclimatized to it. For you strength coaches, if, I know it's weight, but until you've played your sport with weight on it like this, you don't really understand how it's going to impact you. So we recommend having some playtime or acclimatization time through the guidelines I'm talking to you about today that give you a chance to say, all right, I get this. In season, it's a great protocol to work as well. The two things you need, no matter what you do, is you do need to invest in understanding it. We certainly have enough experience from the company side to help guide you check out the videos we have and the stuff we have online and at the website to get in more information in specific sports. Is that bar answering all our problems? I know as strength coaches, we love the bar because most of us came from some version of that background. Even to this day, I keep, I do heavy weights once a week for one reason only, to help keep muscle mass. But I notice its detrimental effect in other areas of my boxing. My coach notices it right away. It's got a valuable tool. The question again is how much? We've now seen through what we call research-backed versus claims-backed um, uh, focus. And that is, we've produced, I think, over three dozen research papers on exogen and how its benefits relate to real performance. And that's really important because we wanted to make sure we weren't just telling you it's weight training and it works. We wanted to know exactly how. And these are some simple guidelines you can think of in where it works for what type of training you're focused on. So for specific speed, and that means general speed, not specific technical issues, if you're working on that, you generally need a four to eight week block or two four week blocks. For technical skill, that means take a specific skill. It could be a hip engagement, it could be an arm movement, it could be a rotation, or something like a tweak on your tennis serve or your golf swing. We generally see that you need a minimum three to four week block to make a permanent change in that with exogen. So keep that in mind if you're going to work on a technical skill. Movement priming or potentiation, that's immediate. Put exogen on, do a movement, take it off, you will see an immediate effect. And that's one of the first things you'll notice when you try it out. So people then ask us, oh, can I use this in a warm-up prior to competition? Of course you can. Just test it out first. Specific endurance, a little different. In terms of specific endurance on a running program, cycling, swimming, whatever it might be, gameplay, endurance is volume, those take a little longer. You'll see change in the first two to four weeks. Permanent change is about six to eight weeks for a block. And then if you're looking for permanent change from the team sport perspective, and that is in GPS data in your zone training. Again, it takes a little longer, probably six to eight weeks to see an entire team's GPS gameplay profile increase as a baseline. That's the who, what, when, where, why of exogen. Take that on board, have a think about where and how you're gonna get started. But most importantly, no matter what you do and start, like any new tool, give yourself a bit of play time. And if you're a fairly elite athlete, you're gonna notice, the, or coach, or whatever it is in your sport, within one to two weeks, you're gonna to wanna to jump in and get beyond play. But play is important, start with that.